Okay, with that, let's, I think we're on. We'll go ahead and get started. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Class Location Methodology Workshop. Um, you know, we're, the goal here today is to pick up the conversation that we started uh, a few months back on the subject of class location, and specifically in addressing the uh, statutory mandate that PHMSA has to deal with the consideration of expansion beyond the current HCA methodology and maybe an alternative regime to the class location concept that is near and dear to a lot of people's hearts that's currently contained in our regulations. Um, but before we get into that, let me go through a, a few meeting, meeting logistics here. First off, if you would um, you know, take your cell phone and make sure they're on vibrate. It's a little advertisement for my Tennessee volunteer cell phone. Um, name tags, you should have picked one up out front. If there wasn't one with your name on it, it means you didn't pre-register. That's not a big issue. Just uh, fill one out if you would. This meeting is being webcast. I'd like to welcome our webcast audience as well today. And um, as far as other restrooms, there is a small restroom. Uh, there are a couple of them, but there's a small one right out uh, to the left as you exit uh, the room here. It's so small that if you would also sign up, we're taking appointments for that restroom <laughs> over the course of the conference. So you may want to get your name on the list. If that doesn't work for you, there's a larger one upstairs on the second floor. Again, if you exit left and go up the steps, uh, there's, there are much larger restrooms up that way. Uh, we will break for lunch, um, and we have a list on the front desk of restaurants that are nearby. Uh, you also have a copy of the agenda. It was on the front desk. You should have grabbed one on your way in. Let me go through a couple of changes that are on the agenda. Oh, most importantly, I should have started off. As far as fire exits go, um, I mean, clearly, uh, you probably saw them when you came in. If you exit these doors at the rear of the room, just straight out um, through those double doors behind this room is the way to get out in case of an emergency. Okay, related to the agenda, um, there are some changes to it. Um, we do have, um, well, first off, after each panel, we plan to have a Q&A. The agenda you have there shows that we have Q&A, just one Q&A for the morning and one in the afternoon. But our plan is to, we'll get through a panel and then we'll have questions and answers at that time. And then also related to the panel number two, we have two panelists. The third panelist, Jim Hottinger, could not join us today. I think that covers, okay, and then we'll, you know, lunch at noon, we'll, noon Eastern time. And we have an hour and a half dedicated for that. You know, again, our agenda should cover it all, should have all the questions. As with um, our usual concept for handling public workshops, we do um, involve a variety of stakeholders represented here today or a broad cross-section of the stakeholder community uh, that are interested in gas pipelines. You know, we have operators, regulators, um, and members of the public represented here as well. And I'd like to thank all of our volunteers or people who are voluntold to be here <laughs> to be our speakers. It's much appreciated. I know you have enough to do in your day job, but uh, appreciate the time you've taken to travel here to, to D the D.C. area to uh, present on a very important topic to all of us. I'd also like to uh, thank our Canadian friends from the National Energy Board. We have Ian Calhoun, who will represent and provide the Canadian perspective. Um, you might notice the weather's a little bit cooler down here. He, I understand he brought that to us, and we're, we just couldn't get enough of the cold weather that we've had this winter. So, Ian, thanks for that. I guess that's why they call it the Alberta Clipper, right? <laughs> so, very chill. I think it's not too much colder than it is in Calgary this morning here. Okay, so um, you know, obviously with the, the different panelists that we have here in the different panels, we're going to give different perspectives on the issue of class locations. Um, and then uh, 
very important to, to everyone is that the presentations that you'll see here today will be available on the uh, website as is our recording of this event. And I've got a link to that, uh, the meeting uh, right there in the slide right, right here. Uh, we are accepting comments. We have been accepting comments on the topic of uh, class location methodology. You could submit comments to the, uh, through the link that you see uh, there on the screen. The comment period does close on May 27th. Also related to questions, uh, we have mics uh, located here in the room. We also have cards available if you don't uh, want to step up to the mic that uh, we'll be passing out. They're also located at the desk in the rear of the room, uh, so you can write your card down. If you're on the webcast, um, if you're joining us by webcast, there's a link on your screen that will allow you to submit a question that way, and we'll receive it by email, and that'll get up to us uh, that way as well. So that is live, so feel free to submit questions that way. We want to make sure that we get you know, input from a you know, everyone who wants to provide their input, it's, it's important for us today, so please be sure to ask questions if you have any. Okay, that covers that. Um, you know, our, go our goal here today is to, um, we're, we're collecting information. We're not here, you know, we being the Office of Pipeline Safety are, are here to collect data and help in, which will help in preparing a report that we're working on that's uh, one of the, part of the statutory mandate to uh, deal with the topic at hand. So our, our, our position is to be neutral, we're accepting input. Our, we're not really interested in really debating right or wrong, we're really looking at options and, and what are ways to go, what are paths forward to go, that, and this will help us as we um, later determine which way we need to go. Uh, we're not currently in rulemaking. That would be determined down the road once we, you know, prepare a report uh, and decide which way we need to go down the road. But then at, at the time of rulemaking, um, then that would be a time where, of course, you, there is debate that occurs as well in various policy, you know, op options for policy direction at that time. Okay, so what we'll do is... I will uh, moderate the first panel, and that will include the federal regulators and then also the Canadian Energy Board. So I'd like to introduce our first panelist. Um, will be Mike Israni. Mike works for us uh, here in the Washington, D.C. office. He's our senior technical advisor. And Mike will kind of lead us into the topic and give you some of the background um, on uh, where we've been and you know, where we're headed with the topic of class location methodology. So with that, Mike. Good morning, all. <clears throat> I'm Mike Israni. I'm Senior Technical Advisor at FEMSA, and I've been with FEMSA since 1994. Uh, so this morning in my presentation, the topics I'm going to cover are the FEMSA objectives. Uh, I'm going to give you an update on Section 5 of the 2011 Act. I'm going to go through the timeline of this project, you know, where, where we've been, where we're going to uh, go forward with this, and I'm going to provide you an overview of class location options that we have, or we are considering, or we want to hear, uh, and then I'm going to go through the comments that we have received on the advanced notice of proposed rulemaking. This was a guest rulemaking where we had a topic on requirements going beyond high consequence areas, integrity management requirements. And we received comments on that topic. And then with a separate notice that came out in August 
2013, uh, whether going outside high consequence areas necessitate uh, mitigation or class location. So on these two different topics, what comments we received, I'm going to summarize those. So with that, I'll go to the first topic. So FIMSA objectives. So as required by the st <clears throat> statutory mandate, uh, we are to prepare a report for the Congress on expansion of integrity management requirements, a program outside of HCAs. And, and our separate, second objective is to determine if going outside HCA uh, mitigates the need for class location requirements. Uh, so our goal here is to seek input from all industry, trades, public, and all stakeholders. Uh, so it goes on a public record, and also it will provide us good input for evaluating what approach we take. And with that analysis and everything, we'll be able to write the report to Congress. And So first let me go through the statutory mandate language. As you see on this slide, uh, the Section 5 of the 2011 Act requires FEMSA to evaluate and issue a report on whether integrity management requirements or elements of IMP should be expanded beyond high consequence areas. So you see this, I'm repeating all this because these are two punch lines. You know. And second one is with respect to gas transmission lines only gas transmission pipeline facilities, whether applying imp requirements, additional areas would mitigate the need for class location, meaning distribution and gathering lines are not covered in that part. So we had to only evaluate for the gas transmission line. And the statutory mandate also had uh, further extension in section 5B, which, which asks us to in the evaluation, we must consider the priority to public safety, to reducing risk uh, in the high consequence areas, and the consideration of costs, incremental costs of applying imp outside of high consequence areas. And it also talks about what is the most effective and efficient option that we consider for IM requirements. Uh, all of these factors were put in that when we go beyond high consequence areas, we should consider all these factors and just not throw in the same requirements of IM across the board all over, uh, which defeats the purpose of risk management program. Uh, and this is being handled in a separate rulemaking uh, for the gas uh, NPRM, where some of these issues will be considered. Uh, and that, that rule is still in progress. Now, just to go through the timeline, uh, August 25th, 2011, is when we issued the advanced notice of proposed rulemaking on the gas transmission lines. And there, there were 15 or 16 topics. But one of the topics was going outside of high consequence areas. And it's on that topic, all the comments that we received is I'm going to review. Then January 3rd, 2012, and notice that's the effective date when the 2011 Act uh, came into place. This is the Regulatory Certainty and Job Creation Act of 2011. And that became effective from January 3rd, 2012. August 1st, uh, 2013. So after the Act came out, it had this requirement about mitigation of class location if you're going outside of IM. That's why we put out another notice uh, of inquiries. So in that notice, we put this separate requirement uh, and asked the questions from the public. Then on February 25th of this year, we brief uh, uh, this pipeline advisory committee, uh, and we wanted to get their recommendations on this topic. And April 16th today, uh, we are having this workshop, uh, and, and the we're going to go through the comments on this workshop. Uh, by the way, management has decided to give 30 days comment period after this workshop. So by May 16th, 
uh, you know, we must, we must receive the comments and they should go to the docket for class location. And then we're gonna summarize uh, these reports by this summer and prepare the report to Congress. Uh, so overview of class location options. Uh, I put it here summary, but it's actually the overview of what options we have. Uh, you know, we could start with no class location or we could have the status quo, like existing class location. I mean, we, we wanted to start from clean slate, you know, what, what all options we have. Uh, or we can have a class location which is modified, meaning the corridor which is fixed at 660 feet, it can be varying as a, with the pipe diameter. Or we could have high consequence areas and the PIR, which is the potential impact radius, uh, be modified or we could have any other alternatives. And we want to hear that today uh, from some panelists and, and the audience, if they have any ideas on this, we'll welcome that. And how should it apply? It should apply to gas transmission or it should apply to others, gathering and distribution as well. Or should it apply to interstate or intrastate? Uh, so all of those factors, including exist, existing line or pre-70 pipelines, or, so all those factors had to be considered if we are gonna change the class location. So class location, uh, as most of you know, were first introduced in the ASME B31-8 in 1950s. So they've been here a good 60 years uh, with us and industry regulators all have been pretty comfortable with that class location regime. Uh, but as you know, uh, as technology improves and everything, we are looking forward to looking at what options are available. Uh, and, and, and as you know, throughout part 192, these class locations are so embedded you know, in all the sections and, sub, and the subparts. Uh, we'll have Steve Nanny cover a lot more detail on this. Uh, in, Early 2000, if you guys remember, we had lots of meetings on the <laughs> integrity management program and we first introduced uh, high consequence areas and discussion on this. At that time, some of these class location issues also came up. Uh, but, but that was created to provide more enhanced requirements on the existing requirements in the high risk areas. Uh, and so we, we define high consequence areas based on PR circle, and there are more rigorous requirements uh, for maintaining the pipeline's integrity. And now I want to switch gears and go to comments that we have received. Uh, no, first, I said that advanced notice of proposed rulemaking, which was issued in 2011, and, and the topic of going outside of uh, high consequence areas. Uh, some of the comments we received, public comments, uh, they clearly said that, I, I'm gonna go through only the punchline of what each commenter said. You'll be hearing some more from the panelists today, uh, but these are the, the gist of, this, this is just a gist of what those comments were saying, that uh, revise the IM to include more mileage, meaning, you know, uh, because in class three and four location, uh, we noticed only 50% of the miles were covered uh, public uh, comments were that we should cover the entire class three four location and that the denser areas of the class four location should have uh, more requirements. Industry comments were that you know, non-HCAs should be left to industry uh, as a voluntary effort. Now this comment came on the advanced notice of proposed rulemaking that industry should voluntarily decide on what non-HCA requirements uh, or are in principle apply to those areas. Uh, NAPSA, which is our state partners, association of state partners, uh, they prefer the current class location system and you're gonna hear the next panel number two is gonna give you more details on that. Uh, and we also received a, petition, we received a petition from Jersey City Mayor's Office, which was concerned that the current uh, class location uh, is not sufficiently reflecting the density of the population, that we should have much higher stringent requirements where pipeline, where the buildings are more than four story 
uh, you know, when, when it's going to these high story buildings to have different uh, requirements for that. Uh, and then on the notice of inquiry, this was the one that we sent out in August of 2013 uh, on the comments on the class location. Industry comments were that you keep the class location uh, intact for existing line. They wanted to off offer these two options, and you're going to hear that uh, today in the afternoon session, that existing li for the existing lines, keep the class location. For the newer lines, the newer approach, maybe potential impact gradients approach uh, for the pipeline, or when the class location changes, they should follow PIR instead of uh, existing, uh, instead of this current regime of class location. Uh, and industry agreed that class location change will really impact entire part 192 throughout. You know, they, they do agree on that. Uh, and they also mentioned that if we do make such a major change, that we should get industry involved uh, as a, you know, stakeholders uh, group to come with some uh, recommendations. Uh, American Gas Association, uh, you know, uh, they also say operators should have a choice of choosing between these two methods. API commented that, the, you know, once you don't have class location, how are you going to determine the gathering lines? You know, whether, so, you know, although here we are trying to refer to our uh, transmission line part only, but if you are changing and all the other options are there, we have to consider gathering lines as well. Uh, AP, APGA felt that, you know, we are already burdened, they're small operators, uh, and they say we are already burdened by so much of, uh, you know, regulations, and they should apply only to the larger than 30% SMICE, all these new changes, uh, and, and the definition of transmission line should be changed. Uh, INGA, uh, you're going to uh, hear in the afternoon session, they, they did say on this notice of inquiry to allow existing class location, uh, or the PIR method, and revise certain operation maintenance requirements that, that we, that which, which are no longer needed. Uh, they feel that in the existing class location uh, requirements that we have, they've been there for a long time, and we should look at new technology and new methods. Uh, uh, Iowa uh, Utilities Board, which is our state partner from Iowa, and they commented that we, they feel that class location has a lot more to offer than what just integrity management program offers. Uh, I mean, we cannot see just one uh, aim to replace class location, but they wanted to kind of see there should be additional safety provided beyond the class location uh, using the PIR method. And you, uh, this uh, Muniz, they felt, you know, as I said before, that they are small pressure, uh, small diameter pipeline, and they should not be impacted by these changes. Uh, they can't afford to be impacted by these changes. Uh, pipeline Safety Trust, and you again hear from Carl Weimer and uh, Rick Cooperwitz on this issue, uh, but they also support applying in beyond high consequence areas and expanding class location definitions and strengthening existing integrity management rule means they wanted to see that we can improve on the even existing uh, imp requirements uh, and also cover more areas than what currently we cover. Uh, and NAFSA uh, commented, this was uh, in the testimony to Congress after San Bruno case. Uh, they, when they were asked about this question, they, in their testimony, they in indicated the class location applied much more the integrity management, and they explain how it affects all the design, valve spacing, and uh, authorization, and everything else. So we should not try to make changes to class location, and they have much broader concept on this. Uh, in summary, uh, there's a broad perspective from industry and public on the expansion of M requirements uh, beyond high consequence area. You know, in general, industry also feels that currently what is in the HCAs some other principles can go beyond high consequence areas. Uh, and they also agree that these changes to class location would have a, a tremendous impact uh, in the regulatory impact. And also, they also mentioned that there are other alternatives that we should also consider. 
And with that, I'll pass on to Steve Nanny. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, I wanted to clarify a couple of things just to, I guess, highlight uh, from Mike's presentation related to, you know, what's in play right now. Of course, we're here to talk about class location, and that is to, de to deal with a statutory mandate. We, we had a notice of inquiry that was a federal register notice to deal with this topic. So, and that's what we're here for today is to collect the information on class location that will help inform our report. So this is a data point for that report. Also in play is the, uh, as Mike had pointed out, there's, there was an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking for, for gas for 192. Asked a number of questions that Mike had highlighted in his, in his um, presentation. In follow-up to that, we have developed, and then we also had the process, as many of you recall, on the integrity verification process. All that is rolled up into what we hope to issue later this year, notice, notice of proposed rulemaking for 192 that deals with that. So, you know, that's kind of an initiative in play that deals with class or deals with HCAs uh, potentially. But then here today, we're here to talk about, okay, class location, the methodology in response to a statutory mandate. But there are you know, two kind of major issues in play right now. One's well underway. This one, we're just, okay, looking at the options and where do we need to go on that that, that will help inform our report. So. And the 30, I saw a little bit of head scratching on the 30 days. That's just, hey, we, you know, to help inform our report, we're accepting comments and we've got to cut it off somewhere. But that's only for the the report. If we you know, go further later down the road, if there's some sort of rulemaking that's proposed, then you have another comment period for that that's involved there. So, yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but mm -hmm. the head scratching for me was, I believe you said May 27 and Mike said May 16th, so you may want to clarify. Oh, cl okay. You, you used two different dates, I believe, so that was the head scratching, I think. Alan's right. Oh, Alan's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right, Mike, we'll talk later about that. Thank you. That's good. Yeah, good. All right. <laughs> okay. With that, next up is Steve Nanny, the senior engineer who works for our headquarters engineering group out of our Houston office. So, Steve will. And Steve will close out the federal regulatory perspective. All right, take it away. My name's Steve Nanny, as Alan said. And before we get started, I thought I'd put this picture up because I'm sure each one of you, when you came in here yesterday, this, that, that is what you were expecting to see here in Washington, was the cherry blossoms and to, and to walk down by the tidal basin and, and smell the cherries, as I, as I would say it. But instead, you got cold weather, 30 degree temperatures and rain. So <laughs> that's what happens sometimes. But but as you can see, last week it was very pretty here in the D.C. area. To just get started on the topics that, that I will cover today is uh, I'm going to do an overview of the Federal Register Notice, uh, the class location approach to touch base on it. I know many of you in here understand that better than I do, but you've got to realize there are folks that will be downloading and looking at this online that we want them to understand what the class location approach means. Uh, also, class location change what the possible impact may or may not be. And then the integrity management approach, what that is and what any changes there would mean. And then other alternatives. You know, when we look through the uh, advance notice, uh, other folks had other alternatives to consider. So we've got some of those highlighted today as we go through. And then just a summary of where we're going uh, with this. The Federal Register notice, uh, uh, there were 15 questions in the uh, uh, August the 1st, 2013 notice. Uh, first is, uh, as you'll see here, is design factor. Should we increase or decrease them in densely populated areas? That was one question. Number two, class locations. 
Should they be eliminated and should we use a single design factor? Three is should that single design factor for the areas, should we use it for large concentrations of populations so, such as schools, hospitals, nursing homes, uh, multi-story buildings, stadiums, uh, locations such as that? Uh, question four was should we allow the increase of the MAOP from the present MAOP to a single design factory? And, and if you have an existing pipeline, what do we do with them? That's what we were asking there. Going to the next slide, questions five through 15, rather than listing each one of them, uh, on the next two slides, I just wanted to uh, uh, highlight them. And they basically had to do with single, multiple design factor pipelines, what considerations. The, the first item that we had, which was question five, uh, what should we do to existing pipelines? What should we do with pre-1970 or pre-code pipelines? And that would include like uh, low frequency ERW pipelines, lap welded pipelines, in other words, pipelines with seam problems, or pipelines with stress corrosion cracking problems. And do we treat new pipelines different than the existing pipelines? Uh, the, the next item that we had highlighted, uh, should we use periodic integrity management measures instead of the class locations? And then going down through that is what do we do with pipe that has seam quality issues, pipe coating issues, uh, girth weld uh, coating quality issues. And then if you've got a pipeline that's had failures and leaks, uh, what do we do as far as looking at root cause analysis? How do we consider that uh, for, for existing pipelines or in-service pipelines? How would we use that uh, in the program? And then a, another item that we've talked about would be documentation. If you do have a, a pipeline with documentation issues, whether that's material strength, wall thickness, seam type. And then last is, uh, would be the uh, grandfather clause issue is uh, test pressure requirements and records. In, in other words, if you've got a grandfathered pipeline and you may or may not have uh, complete records, what would we do there? The, some of the other considerations that we'd highlighted in there is pipe manufacturing quality controls. In other words, uh, let's say we, we implement this for new pipelines or even uh, for old pipelines. What would we consider for, for steel quality, seam quality, toughness quality, and uh, pressure testing quality? What, what should be the levels? Uh, and, and that's what we're hoping to hear today as we see presentations uh, from, from others in our group. What are your recommendations? Now, we've gone through the, uh, uh, the submittals we've got on the docket today. We've looked at them, and, and I'll be highlighting a, a few of those. But that's the type of things, as we go through and prepare a report, we'll be touching base. On construction, should an, an operator qualification program for construction be required if a pipeline falls under this? Another item that's in, built in the code is mainline valve spacing, and, and should we consider remote operation for emergency isolation? In other words, if we should go to a, a program where we, uh, we go from class location to whether it's integrity management or, or maybe a hybrid between them, uh, should we have requirements for remote operation of valves? And should we have a a minimum, maximum spacing criteria in there, no matter what class location it wound up being, or you could say imp uh, class location that it may be. And then, then the last bullet here that was basically question 15 in the, uh, in the notice was, what do we do if we do go to an integrity management approach, what do we do as far as assessment and remediation criteria for defects? Do we keep what's in the present program do we modify it? Do we have something different for old pipelines versus new? How do we consider that? So that's some of the issues that, that we had uh, outlined in the notice. That's some of the questions that, that we were asking. To just give an idea or a highlight of, of what we're looking at here as far as the, the class one, two, three, and four, uh, tr steel transmission pipelines uh, or transmission pipelines, I, I, I'd better say, is uh, we've got approximately 302,000 miles. 
And, uh, and as far as HCA miles, we've got 19,534. That is if my math adds up on here. I was looking at my slides last night and I realized uh, I couldn't add when I, when I put them together. I was off by, by one, I think. But, but you can see the difference in HCA miles is about 6.5% of the total transmission mileage. And, and the class three and four is about 35,000 miles. Also, if you break it down to interstate and intrastate, uh, and uh, looking at gas gathering and gas distribution, you can see the, uh, the uh, gas gathering mileage is uh, approximately 17,000 miles. The gas distribution is over uh, 2 million miles. Uh, what is a class one through four location? Uh, here's some examples of what a class one location would, would look like. You can see in the uh, upper left hand corner, you know, where you just got a, a, a couple of houses along the pipeline. Uh, in the bottom right hand is a class two location, which is a partial field and, and partial development. A uh, class three location where you've got some uh, uh, a school in a, in a ballpark, and then a class four location where you've got multi-story buildings. And, and I, I'm a visual person. I always think pictures tell you a lot more than a definition with a lot of words. So I thought I'd throw this in so everyone would, would, would get a visual of what I'm talking about when I put some words for you to look at. Now, now here's the definition. Here's the part that I always get thrown a, a loop on, but uh, uh, if you go look in the code uh, under 192.5 is a class location definition. And, and, a, and a class location unit is an onshore area that extends 220 yards on either side of the center line uh, of a pipeline for a continuous one mile length. And uh, you can see the example here that I've, uh, that I've got of a, a highlighted in the bottom right hand corner showing a class uh, one, two, and three location, and down at the bottom of it, uh, you can see it shows what a class one would be if you weren't uh, looking at it as far as a continuous sliding mile, a class two, and a class three, and, and uh, shows uh, uh, how we, we uh, actually consider a uh, class location unit. The, the actual definition would be for a class one, it, it's 10 or less buildings for human occupancy or an offshore area, which is not the topic of today's uh, meeting. And this will just give you an idea of uh, basically what a class one area would look like. A class two area is greater than 10, but less than 46 buildings. And you can see in red a, a pipeline going through a subdivision, and, and this is a, it would be a class two. A class three uh, would be 46 or more buildings. Uh, you can see here uh, where the pipeline's going uh, uh, through some parks with a lot of uh, residential uh, housing around it. And a class three location is also an area where you've got a playground, recreational area, or outdoor theater, uh, where it's occupied uh, by 20 or more persons on at least five days a week uh, for 10 weeks in any 12 month period. And here's an example, two examples of if if a pipeline was near these, uh, it'd be a class three uh, location. And the last one showing class locations is here's an, a location where if you had a pipeline in, uh, uh, in an area with multi-story buildings, that would be a, a class four where they're pr predominant. And here's another uh, picture showing uh, an area where a pipeline is uh, uh, traversing uh, an area with a, with a freeway, some schools, uh, multi-story buildings, and, and on either side in blue is the uh, approximation of where the uh, 660 foot or, or 220 yard boundary would be of coming up with the uh, class location. Some of the uh, examples of class location uh, here, uh, and I'm not going to go through each one of them, but it just shows you a, a class one, two, three. I don't have an example of a class four. And in the, on the right-hand side, it shows a clustering uh, where you might have an area that's a class three, and then on over to the, uh, to the right of it, you'll see where there's some uh, additional uh, 
uh, buildings that make that area a class three also. And that's called clustering and it's uh, called uh, the sliding mile. What is the purpose of class locations? Class locations are used for basically four things in the code. Design, MAOP determination, construction, and operations and maintenance. The purpose of class locations uh, for design is for safety factors. And there's uh, basically four safety factors. Class one is 0.72, class two is 0.6, Class three is 0.5, class four is 0.4. If you've got a road or railroad crossing or something like that, uh, if it's uncased, there'd be one step down in class. In other words, if it was a class one, you'd design it for class two or, or class three, depending upon what the operator wanted to do there. If it was cased, you would not have to take the step down uh, in design factor. If you have a compressor station or a regulating station, meter station, or if it's an offshore platform, the design factor is 0.5. Class locations are also used for valve spacing on the mainline pipeline. Uh, if it's a class one, a valve needs to be uh, within 10 miles. Sometimes we say that's 20 miles because if, it, if you're right in the middle of it, you, go, you can go 10 miles either way, and so you have a 20 mile spacing. So don't think I've compressed it down with the way I've got it. This is just how it is in the code, it's written. Class two would be seven and a half or 15 miles. Class three would be within four miles. Class four would be within two and a half miles of a valve. It's also used for uh, determining uh, gathering lines, how they're regulating for gas gathering. And it's also used for the design factor for steel pipelines if it's a gas gathering line. Other things that it's used for is maximum allowable operating pressure, or MAOP determination. Uh, it's used that in, in calculating the pressure through wall thickness, uh, grade, seam type, uh, to determine the MAOP. It's also used, as you can see down here, for the pressure test factors. Uh, whether it's on a class one, two, three, or four, uh, those factors would change anywhere from a 1.1 or 1.25 and if it's in a class three or four, it would be 1.5 would be the uh, factor that you'd have to test it. Uh, class locations for construction, it's used to determine the depth of cover, whether it's 30 inches or 36 inches. And also if you're in rock, uh, what it would need to be there. As far as the uh, girth well and undestructive inspection, uh, there's different levels of uh, inspection there that you have to do of class one, two, or th three, or four. And you can see those, it varies from 10% to 100% if you're in class three and four. Other things that you use class locations for is operations and maintenance. You use it for the frequency. If it's a line patrol, if it's a leakage survey, pipeline markers, it, it somewhat keys into overpressure protection. There's some limits there. Remaining strength calculations, if you're doing an anomaly repair, things like that, and integrity management. Uh, if, you, if you're using method one, if it's a class three or four, that's what you use in, in method one determination. Again, just to highlight all the various sections that uh, have an impact uh, on class location, uh, basically it's most sections of the code. And the things that I just highlighted uh, you can see here some of the things that it, uh, that it, it does. Uh, of course, in subpart A, it's class location. Your pipe characteristics, how thick the pipe is, the grade uh, is determined by class location factors. And again, as I said earlier, non-destructive tests, depth of cover, remaining strength and repairs, test factors. Uh, again, this just shows you where you go in the code to find it. And uh, in uh, the actual code section in the next two slides, uh, I've got it listed. If you want to go back and find some of them, uh, you'll find them here listed as far as areas uh, that it does affect. I'm not going to read each one of them, but uh, I definitely wanted it where if you want to download it later and look, you can. Class location. As more people live or work near the pipeline, we all know a class location may occur. I think that's part of the discussion here. 
is what do we do when we have class location changes? What, what is the most prudent thing to do? Uh, the present options we have is you can reduce the pipeline segment MAOP. You can take a pressure reduction. You can replace the existing pipe. If you do that, by replacing it, it allows the use of new material and construction techniques. Our, uh, no action if the MAOP is commensurate with the new class location. In other words, uh, uh, if you're operating uh, uh, below uh, what it needs to be. You can conduct a pressure test to establish an MAOP for a class change or a one class change bump. If you're going from class one to two or two to three or three to four, uh, you can use the uh, pressure test option. And, and in the past, uh, some, one of the other options was a special permit. Uh, uh, you could come to FEMSA for a special permit, even though, as you know, in the last, some of the other meetings, uh, Jeff Weiss has said that we're really not wanting very many of those for uh, class changes. What is the integrity management approach? The usage of high consequence areas or HCAs. Let's go through them on the next several slides. The integrity management approach and the gas integrity management, it uses HCAs to identify areas of high consequence along the pipelines. HCAs are defined by the number of buildings or identified sites where people live or congregate. And also we use a PIR. They're calculated based upon pipe diameter, MAOP, and the, and the heat of comp combustion of natural gas. And that's either a 0.69 factor or 0.73 if you look in the code. And, and you can see here the PIR circle that we would use. The, uh, the actual calculation method is listed there in the last bullet. Integrity management approach. Pipeline segments and HCAs were subject to ongoing integrity and threat assessments. There's a remediation of anomalies and a P&M measures uh, designed to reduce the risk. HCAs require an operator to assess and remediate the pipeline segment, but they're not used presently to design, establish MAOP, pressure test, or perform O&M type activities. A high consequence area is identified in a gas operator's integrity management program by two methods. Uh, method one is, a, is either an existing class three or four area and then a, a PIR. In other words, if the PIR contains identified site in a class one or two location. Now I'll go through what an identified site is on an upcoming slide. Method two is uh, if you can use a PIR that contains 20 or more buildings for human occupancy, and you actually use the circle in method two, and also method two would be if you have an identified site. I think what FEMSA sees today, most operators are using method two. Some may use method one, but what we're seeing in most gas integrity programs is method two being used. HCA, what is an identified site? That's an area where it's uh, uh, greater than 20 persons for at least 50 days in a 12-month period. Uh, buildings uh, uh, with greater than, than uh, looks like I, I put the same thing down almost twice. Buildings with a greater than 20 persons for at least five days, for 10 days a week in a 12-month period. And then a facility occupied by persons who are con confirmed are confined, mobility impaired, or would be difficult to evacuate. In other words, a hospital, a school, a nursing home, places such as that. Uh, here's a, here would be a method two site where you have a PIR. Uh, again, uh, this is a, uh, uh, the house in the middle uh, would be like a, a place where it is an identified site, and uh, you would put a, a circle, a PIR circle, uh, that touches it, and the whole area there, as you can see down at the bottom where I have HCA, would be the uh, length of the HCA. Again, here's a, a picture of an actual HCA where you uh, have a, a church, and you can see the circles, and you can see the, uh, uh, the distance of the uh, identified site. And that would also, in a class location type uh, category, be a class three area. 
Uh, this is another method. Uh, this is the uh, PIR method two, just showing you again uh, the circles, uh, the, the 20 buildings or more, and how the actual circles move back and forth, and you just move them uh, down the uh, right of way of the pipeline. Uh, here's an example of a class two location, uh, or a uh, HCA method two. The round circle uh, would be the uh, uh, HCA method two, and then this whole area would be a class two location. Just to give you an example how they, they both would work out. The purpose of HCAs and integrity management programs. Uh, first, uh, they're, they're used to evaluate uh, in an imp program, they're required to have an ongoing risk and threat uh, assessment. They have ongoing integrity assessments and you have to remediate any conditions that you find uh, that are detrimental uh, to the pipeline. And also you have to have additional preventative and mitigative measures in place. Uh, the, the assessment methods that you can use in an HCA or in an integrity management program for an HCA would be a pressure test, inline inspection, there's direct assessment methods, and other technology or the code approved methods. And your assessments must have a a timing and a remediation schedule for anomalies. And that's outlined in the code what that should be today. To give you an idea of what's, uh, what's happened over the years, uh, the, the graph that's shown here is a plot of the PIR. The, uh, the formula that's down at the bottom of the slide is the PIR for an HCA. Uh, the, red the red line that goes across that's got the class location 660 feet, that's just giving you a comparison of a 660 foot uh, offset or 220 yards for a class location uh, versus an HCA. You can see from most pipelines, if you had a pipeline that was an 8 inch, 12 inch, 20 inch and below in most cases, up to 1,400 pounds, you're going to be below the 600, your blast radius is going to be below the 660 feet. If you've got a pipeline that's uh, a 36 inch or 42 inch and it's operating at uh, 800 pounds or greater, it's going to be above the 660 feet. So this just gives you an example. Back uh, when, uh, when the code came into place in 1971, and even before that, in B31-8, and the 660 was uh, adopted, there weren't very many, if any, 42-inch, 1,400-pound pipelines uh, in the U.S. Uh, there were a few 36. Most of the pipelines were 30-inch, and most of them operated at 1,000 pounds or less. Not saying all of them, there were a few that, that operated above 1,000 pounds, but the majority would be uh, 30 inch or less, and they'd operate below 1,000 pounds. Today, we have more pipelines that are, that are operating 30 inch up to 42 inch that are above 1,000 pounds. So this just gives you an idea of where we are today, what the PIR means versus the 660. So, it, so that everybody in your mind, if you want to come back and look at something, that gives you an idea when you hear other folks talking today, and, and, and some may be for uh, integrity management approach, some may be for a class location, but I think this change where we've got more bigger lines, we've got higher pressures versus the smaller lines, lower pressures, this is probably the divide in what everyone will be talking about. And, and, and what integrity management uh, areas you use? What do you use for the design of the pipeline when it's new? what would you use to evaluate it if it was an existing pipeline, and what those ongoing measures would be. Now let's look at some, some alternatives that PHMSA has seen and uh, what uh, uh, the public, the industry, uh, has posted uh, in our docket as far as alternatives. And, and this is just taking what we've read through and, and, and what we've heard uh, said to us. We've just tried to outline some things for discussion. Not that PHMSA has taken an, uh, uh, a stance on one versus the other, it's just to get it out uh, for discussion. Uh, no class locations. In other words, we have a single design factor for all pipeline locations. 
Uh, we'd have a higher design factor for stations, highway crossings, et cetera. And we'd also use a, an integrity management approach uh, ongoing on those lines. The next option, as you look, the next bullet, a sliding mile based upon a potential uh, impact radius. In other words, uh, do we use a, a, a PIR approach uh, and it expands and, and uh, decreases based upon the, uh, the diameter and the pressure of the pipeline? The third bullet here is do we expand class locations? Uh, we had a comment, uh, as Mike, as Ronnie said earlier, uh, from, uh, from one of the cities that said, should we uh, go from class five up to class seven with some lower design factors? Uh, class locations, do, uh, do we have uh, no change or do we have minor changes? Uh, in other words, if we have minor change, should there be some tiered width boundaries? Do we keep the 660, but maybe for some of the bigger, higher pressured lines, we move the 660 uh, to some other footage? For the uh, smaller pipelines at lower pressures, do we bring the 660 to 330 or something? Do we do something such as that? Uh, to just go through a, a, a little bit more explanation, if we have a single de design factor, should the single design factor be applied to class locations? Uh, are you for it or against it? That's what I think we'll be hearing today. If so, what design factor should be used? Do we, do we use a 0.72? Do we use a 0.6? Do we use a 0.5? What do we use? Uh, should integrity management programs be expanded to cover more areas, uh, such as all of the existing class three or four areas? If we went with this, uh, would we need to change the method two, method one in our integrity management program? The sliding mile based upon the, the PIR, and, and that would be one of the alternatives. What would we do there? Would we keep class one, two, three, and four locations? and just use a sliding mile based upon uh, a, a number of buildings uh, in that area. In other words, we, we take a, a hybrid approach. And then we would also uh, keep an identified site in, in any class location that would be part of this program. Another, do we expand the class uh, locations? Uh, like I said earlier, and as Mike had said, uh, in our advance notice, we did get a, a call that from several responders that we should define a, a class location density for, for each new class location and we should establish a new design factor. In, in other words, expand it uh, with some different uh, definitions of uh, 0 0.72, 0 0.6, things such as that. If we did something like that, would that be for new pipelines, existing pipelines, or both? Expand the class locations. Uh, the present class locations are as I've got here at the top part of the slide. And again, the new class locations that we've heard is re redefine the class location for, for steel pipelines to a class five, six, or seven. If we did that, what design factors would we use? Uh, and again, would we redefine the, the 220 a yard or 660 foot value? Another would be class location with no or minor changes. An option one would be don't do anything. Leave it just like it is. An option two would be update it based upon, uh, uh, as I described earlier, usage of higher M MAOP since the code was adopted. Since we have gone to bigger diameters and, and higher pressures, uh, should we uh, use a sliding mile and a PRR calculation based upon using the bigger diameters and uh, in higher pressures. In other words, it wouldn't be one size fits all. It would be a size that fits uh, the, the, the applicability for that pipeline. In other words, if it was an 8-inch, 300-pound pipeline, it would not be treated the same as a 42-inch, 1,600-pound pipeline. And this is just an example of uh, what I'm talking about there, is, is if you look uh, on the uh, on the left is a bigger circle. It's going past what the, uh, the, the present limits are if it was a bigger pipeline, or if it was around a 38,000 pound pipeline, it would probably stay uh, like I'm showing in the middle with the blue circles. 
And if it was an eight inch or 12 inch, that circle may, may go down. Should we do it to where it's sliding for each individual pipeline or should we maybe look at maybe three tiers or four tiers and you fall into that tier so that we, we don't have a, a different size for every pipeline? And again, as you can see here, is, uh, we're, we're, we're expecting to see comments as we go through today and some of the questions. That's why I've got X's there, is FEMSA hasn't got a position on it. And again, as Mike said earlier, is in summary, where did we go? No class location, a class location with no change, a class location modified or expanded, HCAs with the PIR modified, or, or other alternative methods? Should it apply only to gas transmission, steel pipelines? If we do that, how would it affect gathering and distribution? Uh, the operating stress level, should we, should we have uh, uh, sections there? If it's above 1,000 pounds or above 1,440, that it's treated different than if it's 300 or 400 pounds. Do we treat rich gas different uh, than dry gas? In, in other words, if you've got a BTU of 1,100 pounds, uh, do we treat it different than if it's got one of 1,000 BTU? or 950 or something. Uh, the diameter MAOP, and then the last I've got down here, existing. If it's an existing pipeline, a pre-1970, or new pipeline. You know, do we treat each of those differently? And again, uh, this is the last slide in my presentation, and I, I again wanted you to see the, uh, the cherry blossoms. This is what Washington looked like last week. So. Again, I appreciate your attention, and, uh, and, and I know we're, we're treating this as a very serious m matter, and we appreciate each of you coming today, and your, your thoughts and viewpoints will be uh, listened to by us and looked at later as we go through the process, and thank you for listening. Okay, thanks, Steve. Like Steve said, I mean, Steve did an excellent job summarizing you know, the options that we've seen. So, and so the idea is that we articulated what we've seen. Perhaps there are other ideas. So we look forward to um, perhaps hearing some. We also look forward to hearing from some of you who have some of those other ideas, especially on the afternoon panels with, with industry um, there. So we're going to shift gears here a bit. I'm going to bring up Ian Calhoun, who's with the Canadian National Energy Board. We're um, we have a close relationship with the Canadians within NEB. We, we meet once a year, at least once a year. Uh, we have a meeting coming up in, in May, and we uh, discuss issues of mutual interest. As you know, the pipeline, the molecules still move similarly when they cross the border, and we, we do uh, compare notes on issues that are of mutual interest. Um, so we, we value our relationship, and we also value your input here today. Ian, and uh, if you would come up and give us a Canadian perspective on class location. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First thing I want to say is I am in no way responsible for the weather that accompanied me yesterday. I can understand Alan in a general sense, but when I, when I checked into the hotel yesterday, the lady at the desk took my passport, she looked me right in the face, not a trace of humor, and said, did you all bring this weather with you? <laughs> so actually, no, the first thing I want to say is how happy I am to be here. Uh, this may be a very... <clears throat> poor uh, comment on the State of the Union, but uh, dealing with FIMSA, these technical uh, interactions that Alan talked about is probably one of my greatest sources of sanity in the regulation business. Like I say, that might be a very <clears throat> strange comment on the State of the Union. So the question we're looking at here is, like the winter in all of North America, have uh, classification designations outstayed their welcome? Um, is there a more rational way to do it? 
uh, what are the limitations and what are the sort of path forward. So I'm going to try and give you as much as I can a Canadian perspective. First of all, I have to disclaim that everything I say is of no value whatsoever. <laughs> Whereas the National Energy Board of Canada trusts me uh, to be their chief engineer. They have reservations about me speaking in public. Uh, having said that, I will try as best I can uh, to, to uh, convey the, the, the thinking of the board and the thinking of the staff of, of the board. Um, the basis of uh, this brief presentation, of course, relates to uh, Z662. Apologize for calling it Z. Uh, I'm sure all of you can figure out what it actually means. It's the 26th letter of the alphabet. Uh, but it is our Canadian code, but it is very similar to the, to the American codes. So although it may, some of the re remarks might appear to um, relate directly to that code, they're intended to be a little more general. Uh, the commentary suggests that the, the, uh, the classification concept to a large extent, help is a proxy for uh, consequences. This is where I think I personally see the biggest limitation and where we might actually discuss that too. So the, uh, the codes are certainly uh, open to interpretation. We have the same uh, concept of dwelling unit. Um, uh, Steve talked a little bit about a human occupancy, and I may have winced as he said it because I had to live in, no, I beg your pardon, one month's discussion with our legal people about the word occupancy. Apparently to a liar, it means you're paying rent. Uh, so I was able to help them understand that that is not the case. So when we're talking about human occupancy, we're talking about buildings that are in normal use uh, by humans. And... Um, Again, because there is this openness to interpretation, to what the intent of the code is, I, I don't think the classifications of themselves can be relied upon to give us accurate uh, estimates of the uh, consequences. Um, let me see now. Yeah, Steve went over this here, this class two location. Uh, we have several places in the code. I'm going to talk a little bit about this uh, RBDC uh, annex that we have in the code. It's a non-mandatory an annex. That's uh, reliability-based design and A, that would be DA, direct assessment. A uh, big pardon, reliability-based design and assessment. Uh, uh, Mahar Nassim of uh, CIFR and uh, Mr. Zhu there, did a, a, a survey and come up with, on average, what the uh, population density of, say, a class two would be. It would be 3.3 people per hectare. Uh, and for those of you that don't work in hectares, uh, that looks like three people pretty much sparsely set out in two football fields. However, if you look at the body of the standard, uh, it's very similar to, to, to the U.S. standards. You could have uh, 11 houses with, say, 2.3 people per house, and they could be clustered, again, as Steve uh, was so kind as to point in his visual manner of presenting things, which is excellent. Um, that could be a, a cluster of people uh, right next to the pipeline, which might be 25 people. So classifications might not consistently uh, represent uh, failure consequences which is pretty much the summary I had of the, the previous slide. Where we, um, I think where we see the biggest uh, gap uh, would be in the concentration of people. Uh, the US codes are very much better, uh, codes and standards are very much better, uh, more explicit in how to do that than we are in Canada. Um, what we, we state, for example, is that uh, a building is occupied by 20 or more people in normal use, which is a bit of a vague term, uh, would be class two. So uh, if you have 200 people, that's greater than 20, would that be a class two? 
Well, um, if you have a, if you think of a class three, which I, again, using uh, the numbers that Steve gave you, 46 houses, again, at 2.3 people, that would be 106. So shouldn't that first one be a class three? Well, you could interpret the Canadian code to say that no, it's greater than 200 uh, people. Um, it, it could be, it must be a class two. And we actually had an egregious example of that. Um, we had a building, a recreational building, which had 1,040 uh, occupation, oc occupancy load. Uh, the company that was uh, doing the design of the pipeline uh, quite rightly noted that 1,040 was greater than 20, and therefore it was a class two. So the theme that I'm sort of harping on is that a better way to deal with consequences is a direct approach rather than using the, the, the classification as a proxy. For one thing, it's misinterpreted, and for another thing, it may be, in fact, not clear. Um, Steve mentioned schools. Um, one other uh, situation we had in an application was a remediation measure that was proposed by a company and the remediation measure went along uh, the segment of pipeline and stopped exactly halfway through the school. That turned out to be about the last place there was a dwelling unit. Schools are not very well defined in, in our code. I noticed that Steve actually did mention them. We only talk about um, nursing homes and uh, hospitals and the like. Uh, I would strongly agree that things like schools, high schools, should be uh, considered. High school kids can run pretty fast, but they've got 30 seconds to do it, so, and, they don't run, and they're more liable to stop and look at this awesome, great uh, fireball, which would be a disastrous thing. So a more rigorous approach, I'm saying, would uh, result in fewer inconsistencies. Um, I won't go through all of these. We had a bit of a workshop on the learnings from the tragedy at San Bruno, which was a terrible tragedy, um, about improved hazard identification. Uh, hazard, incidentally, is how we pronounce T-H-R-E-A-T in Canada. It's exactly the same as a threat in, in the U.S. Uh, for some reason, well, I know the reason. It's because we're Canadian. I mean, it's, it's pretty straightforward. For some reason, we call it hazard, but it's exactly to all intents and purposes the same as the threat. We address valve requirements, strength and leak detection, etc. It's the last bullet that I want to bring to your attention, is deal with this situation where in a class one or class two, concentrations of people are um, allowed, but not very well dealt with. Uh, it wouldn't be a Canadian presentation, if it didn't have a lot of French in it, so here's a little French for you, le panier de crab. Uh, is bucket, of, I beg your pardon, a can of worms would be what it really is. What we've identified are areas where pipeline very well might be correctly designated by the class location, but it does not represent the, um, the consequence. I mentioned the 1,040 people in the recreation building. I mentioned... Um, something else that I forget. And I would like to mention there a case where we have a 30-inch pipeline that goes through um, a shopping mall, a large shopping mall. So we have identified ad hoc a number of these things and have now put in place a program for us to investigate what, how big this, this bucket of crab, this basket of crabs is, how big this can of worms is. Uh, with the idea that we may then talk to industry and have them do a rational analysis of their own. Five minutes. Uh, the path forward, it's my last slide, second last slide. Last slide is to say thank you. Uh, if, we're, if we're nothing else, we're polite in Canada. <laughs> That's my fifth Canadian joke, is it? I think it is something like that. Um, the optimum approach might be some version of a, a quantitative risk assessment. I think it probably is. And as I mentioned a little earlier in the presentation, we already have a, a non-mandatory uh, annex called Annex O, 
which is a reliability-based design and assessment. Um, we were part of the development of it, but we have not yet uh, sort of embraced it. And partially that was because the, the reliability targets seemed to us to be a little too lenient. So we're getting that sorted out. That might be the method forward. An interim approach for Canada uh, might be to tighten up the definitions uh, in line with the, 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 the U.S. definitions. Uh, and, for example, we could address this question explicitly as it is in the U.S. codes of um, concentrations of people. So the path forward for us in Canada probably is going to be further development of um, Annex O and then see what companies uh, apply under that annex and evaluate in practice what it actually means for pipeline integrity. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Ian. I don't think... Um, you did a good job with the southern saying y'all or something up front, but I didn't hear you say my favorite Canadian word once, uh, process. But uh, maybe in the Q&A we can pull, pull that one out. So. Uh, I, I wouldn't want to uh, disappoint, Alan. Uh, another thing you may have noticed in my presentation is that M-A-O-P, we spell M-O-P, eh? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we're at that time for questions and answers, hopefully. Um, just a reminder, if you're on the webcast, um, there's a button on the screen that will lead you to an email uh, to send us by email a question, and those will be received here in the room, and we'll address those. We also have cards. If anyone needs a card, please raise your hand. We've got Jim Merritt in the back here, and... Um, Bob over here who's got has cards or we have two mics in the middle of the room or in each uh, aisle of the room so with that um, any questions it's going to take a warm-up huh? okay and if you would please state your name and your affiliation and then very good thanks David Adler Columbia Pipeline Group thank you for a good set of presentations that kind of got the thing the meeting rolling today uh, I think one thing that's clear right off the top is that reasonable people can take different approaches and champion different approaches. It does help to understand where people are coming from, however. So, Steve, I guess I'd ask this question of you. Um, in your presentation, you made it rather clear that the PIR method has some science behind it. For people who might take the current class location approach, is is the basis of the prevalent thinking that it has worked well for a long time, so why change it? Well, in, in looking at the uh, comments that we've gotten on the advance notice, as, uh, some of the comments has been, first of all, it's embedded in the O&M. If, you're, if you've got a distribution pipeline, if you're here, uh, you know, one of the reps there, uh, you, you know, you do a lot of your work in O and M based upon whether it's a class one, two, three, or four. So that's that's probably a lot of the comments we've got is if we if we change from the class location to the imps, the frequency of various things we have to do. How would that change from new to if it's a new pipeline versus existing? Would it be the same? As, as far as looking at, at newer technology and, and different thinking, it's like what I showed in the, uh, in, in the slide, is uh, technology, if you go back and you look in the 50s, uh, there was a, basically a pressure limit. It may not have been one written, but if you go look, there were very few pipelines that operated above 1,000 pounds. They were not that many, if any, above 36 inch and not that many above 30 inch. Well, today we've got more above that. But we're also making, if you're an operator that's got a pipeline that's eight inches, you're under, you're using a 660 for an eight inch, 300 pound line, just like you are for a 42 inch, 1600 pound line. That's the, you know, some of the comments that, that we saw in looking is uh, the, the, the folks that were, that were proposing uh, 
uh, going to a AMP HCA method uh, brought that up to us in their their comments that that we're we're treating the lines that have smaller risk, uh, smaller consequences too because of uh, not, not really being that many people around based upon their PIR. So we've looked at that. We're that's why we brought it out in our presentation to show is to present all sides and, and let everyone. Uh, here, uh, all sides and, and why they're bringing those up. Uh, Terry Boss with Inga. I uh, just wanted to add a little bit of background. I really appreciate the discussion you had here, and I think it sets the stage for what's out there. Uh, originally, in the ASME type regulations for the gas side, they had built in design factors depending on the population of what they thought they were going to be building the pipeline. On the liquid side, there was no consideration at that time, and that was a history on how it was built. In 1968 was basically the first time that they incorporated operational maintenance considerations into that design factor, and they articulated that something should change if you had a population around there. So that's the first time that folks went back out and resurveyed their pipelines to see if population had changed after design. Obviously, some of those things were incorporated in the 70s uh, when the um, uh, code was established, the regulations established on that, but that's kind of the history behind it. I think some of the big concerns, and, and you'll see that articulated in the Inga presentations, is is if you're doing some major capital expenditures on the thing as a result of population changes, that seems to be the biggest cost item out there. And has the technology progressed enough uh, beyond when these rules and codes were established that would actually substitute for the technology of replacing pipe or going with thicker wall pipe? So I, I think that's some additional background to add to that. Thank you. Carl? Morning, Carl Weimer of the Pipeline Safety Trust. As we've heard this morning, there's some serious interplay between integrity management in class locations, and there's some a variety of issues already under works for integrity management. I was wondering, and maybe it's a question for you, Alan, if you could comment on where those are at. For instance, I know that the Secretary's Office is doing an audit on the integrity management plan. Uh, how well it, how well it's worked. We got an initial copy of that, and we're told it'd be out in 30 to 60 days. That was 15 months ago. I'm wondering if you could tell us where that audit's at, and also when we'll be seeing what's be, being referred to as the uh, the uh, mega rule for gas pipelines that was mentioned as an ARPM already came out. Okay. Thanks, Wolf. The audit of our and. The Secretary undertook a, or it was delegated to FEMSA, an audit of our integrity management uh, program and the effectiveness. There is a draft report out, as you say, and, and it is under concurrence um, right right now. And it's, it's, I know it's taken some time. I wish I had a better answer as far as, okay, when it will be out. But I just know there's just a pretty extensive vetting process for that because just want to have a thoughtful, carefully prepared, uh, relevant report out and just taking some some time to vet that and I, but you know so hopefully um, this year sometime but I, you know even that's just an educated guess on, on that um, you know it's it, it's almost like rulemaking sometimes you know you see us we issue a lot of policies and just getting getting to where it just gets kicked out the door it, it can get just to make sure the final T's and I's uh, T's across and I's are dotted it can be uh, pretty grueling sometimes Related to the rule, um, the, the gas rule that we, uh, you know, had the AMPRM on, um, we, we have uh, worked on that. We finished drafting that rule, um, the proposed rule that would be issued, and that's just in concurrence within the department right now. Uh, the process has been a bit slow lately, so it's really hard to predict uh, these days, but again, I would hope that would be out sometime this year too, but it's, it's very difficult to predict. Um, when that will actually be out, but um, again, hopefully later this year. Okay, and we had a, um, I don't know if that, that doesn't really answer your question, Carl, <laughs> but it tells you where we are with it. And, uh, 
Okay, we had a question from the web. Uh, why would you, I guess this will go to Steve, uh, why would you consider decreasing the distance from 660 um, for lower for a lower PSI line, wouldn't you consider safety first was the question. I mean, why would you consider reducing the distance? Yeah. Was that covered in your slides? And, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, the, reason, the reason we pointed that out, if you, if you go back and you look at the uh, chart it, and you look at the uh, potential impact radius, if you did have an explosion or, or rupture, if you've got a, a six or eight inch pipeline operating at two or three hundred pounds, uh, first of all, it's probably not going to rupture, it's probably going to leak. But if you did have a rupture, uh, it's probably only going to affect probably three hundred feet. Uh, 660 is, a, is probably a, a safety factor of two past that. And the, and the key point of us pointing it out is we want to get comments from everyone on the safety aspect. Should the 660 stay the same? Or if we did go to some type sliding PIR, should it change based upon diameter and pressure? Uh, FEMS is at this point isn't advocating changing the 660 or not changing it. Uh, we're just pointing out the comments that we've heard from, from everyone that's submitted comments into us. And, and we will consider the safety of that before we do change, if we should. And, and we understand your comment and, and appreciate it. Thanks, Steve. Before I take another question from the web, are there any more questions in here? Or are you still formulating your questions? So I'll give you an opportunity here first before I go to this one. No takers right yet. Um, okay, this is really more of a educational question, Steve, for Steve. How many buildings define a cluster and what is the building spacing to be considered as a cluster? Yeah. That's a <laughs> I, I think they're giving me a test. I'll probably flunk it. So. No. <laughs> no uh, a cluster would be uh, like if you've got a class three and it's uh, uh, you, you've got 46 plus buildings. Uh, the cluster you would go out uh, 220 yards on either side of it. But in that sliding mile, if you had a, another location with uh, with homes or with buildings, that would be a class three also, and you'd have to go 220 yards on both sides of it. That's what the clustering rule is. And in fact, uh, I don't know what slide number it was that I showed, but I showed a good example of that. If, when we post our slides up on the uh, website for this workshop, uh, go to the one where I've got three slides showing clustering and the sliding mile, and it's got a, a, a good example of that and how it should be treated. Okay, any more questions? Feel free to ask whatever questions you have now of our regulator panel. <laughs> okay. I can't resist. DeWitt Bordeaux with Flex Steel Pipeline. I have kind of a two-part question, uh, and it involves probably directed towards Steve as well as our uh, good neighbor to the north and, and confirmation of an understanding of CSA 662. Uh, Steve, you mentioned that uh, consideration or it's open for discussion about uh, whether this should be uh, – any changes applicable strictly to steel materials versus uh, other things as well. And for the gentleman from Canada, uh, confirmation that I'm reading Chapter 13 correctly, that uh, for non-metallic materials under Z662, that uh, your class locations are applicable as they would be the same and consistent with the steel formulas. Well, if you if you look in the footnotes on on my slides and, and some of them, I had steel pipelines. So, what what this is applicable to is steel pipelines. Uh, if you're asking about plastic and composite, uh, it would still be treated the way the uh, code uh, has the, them to be treated in there for plastic pipelines. Uh, first of all, let me thank you for calling me a gentleman. I somewhat somewhat taken aback by that. Uh, yeah, the, it applies to all pipelines. We, uh, the, the classification in uh, Z662 
um, relates is almost independent of the pipeline other than the center line of the pipeline. So it relates to all pipe. It relates even to uh, liquid lines too, although there are <clears throat> not much difference in the way the actual pipe itself is, is, uh, is treated as far as design is concerned. It's treated uh, differently as far as leak detection is concerned. So uh, I guess the short answer is that in, in a Canadian code, uh, the, um, uh, the classifications apply to all types of pipeline. All types, all types of pipeline, yep. Okay, I think it's time for a break. So what we'll do is uh, we'll take 10 minutes and we'll come back at uh, 40 minutes after the hour. So, and let's uh, give a round of applause to our panelists from the morning.